Uh, Emmanuel Mignon is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Stanford and the director of the Stanford Center for Sleep Medicine, Sleep Sciences and Medicine. Welcome, Emmanuel. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for inviting me to this conference. So we are going to go from, uh, you know, us wake to sleep, and hopefully you will stay awake during my talk. Uh, sleep is a very fascinating area, and I think, uh, I mean, what's good is I'm trained as a psychiatrist, but I often say that, uh, you know, as a psychiatrist, when you go to parties and you say you're a psychiatrist, either people love you too much or they are too afraid to talk to you, but being... <laughs> Being a sleep researcher is fantastic because everyone has a sleep problem and is always ready to talk to you about your sleep. Uh, it's also a very interesting area because it's really uh, an area that affects everyone. Of course, we all know that everyone sleeps, but not only everyone sleeps, but there is also uh, an opportunity for a major discovery in science. I mean, overall, I have to admit I'm overall a scientist. I'm interested in biological mechanism. And uh, I know it sounds surprising, but we know a lot about circadian clock and uh, how you regulate your circadian rhythm and the timing of your sleep, but we don't know uh, why we are getting more and more tired as we stay awake longer and longer. The phenomenon of sleep debt, you know, if you don't sleep one night, you are exhausted, two nights you're even more exhausted, and actually we know that chronic sleep deprivation is lethal, but we don't really know what in the brain is producing this. It sounds really stupid, but that's really one of the last remaining uh, biology uh, mystery. And I think, uh, I hope that I will be uh, able to make a dent in this. The second uh, very important uh, question about sleep is that everyone has sleep problems. That's a party cocktail story. <laughs> it's really great. If you don't have a sleep problem, someone in your family has a sleep problem. The most common is sleep apnea. And I'm sure you all know sleep apnea. They're usually male, usually overweight and people snore and stop breathing, so it's a classic <laughs> And then you stop breathing and your oxygen drops and <laughs> you wake up. And then of course, when you do that hundreds of times per night or actually sometimes thousands of times per night, uh, you know, you are completely exhausted in the morning. And because of the apoxia that's uh, associated with sleep apnea, you also develop high blood pressure and you have an increase, for example, of five times of stroke. And, and in fact, uh, it, we know it's a very bad, uh, uh, you know, uh, prognosis. Uh, it's a bit like high blood pressure. It doesn't kill you immediately, but on the long term, we know it has a lot of uh, bad effect on health. And those are very common sleep disorders and insomnia, which affect more women. So unfortunately, the women listen to the men snoring. Uh, they just uh, basically, you can't fall asleep. And when you sleep, you know, you sleep uh, not very well. We know that it has a lot of relationship with depression and, and neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, it's very common, and there are new techniques to treat uh, insomnia that are based on mostly uh, behavioral techniques that are very effective. Then there is restless leg, periodic leg movements. It's less known as people kind of kick and feel that their legs are, are bothering them at night, and it blocks them from falling asleep. And then uh, during the night, they kick their, their legs, and as a consequence, they don't sleep well. It's also very common. And then finally, there's a whole group of people which we don't know why. It's the opposite of insomnia. They are tired all the time during the day, and they don't really know why. It's not depression. It's not that they have sleep apnea but they just feel tired and they feel they have to take a nap. And I think the third aspect of why studying sleep is that really sleep, as I would explain, is that the confluence of three revolutions that makes it really a unique field to work in this area. Uh, we can analyze sleep you know, in, in very unique ways. There is a relationship, a, 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 a really big uh, movement in hardware, and also the possibility now of studying sleep at home. So this is what I wanted to mention. Why study sleep? Because I think it's perfect as a topic for today, as a model for many, many other areas. Uh, it's a confluence of uh, hardware, wearable sleep. Uh, we all have this little actigraph, you know, that in fact don't really measure sleep well. Uh, but more and more, you can also study oxygen saturation. We may be able to study, um, uh, you know, even the EEG, brain waves. And honestly, I don't think there is any real obstacle to studying at, uh, sleep at home technologically well 
and in a recurrent fashion so that you could really measure uh, how your sleep evolved over days or even years. And this could have a very important application for monitoring your health because the time you sleep, you're really doing nothing. You might, so you might as well monitor your, your health. The second aspect is the analytics. Uh, as you will see, it's really uniquely positioned for benefiting from machine learning, especially supervised machine learning. Uh, and then finally, uh, I think you heard Mike Snyder, but there is a real revolution in genetics, so we, we heard about 23andMe. But the relation to genetic, as I will point out, is actually almost passé, but there is a new revolution that's coming, which is a, relation, a revolution in bio, awesome biomarkers such as proteomics. And I think trying to merge all this area is really uh, exciting in the area of sleep. So this is what we do now, which is totally absurd. It looks like a picture of the 1950s, but actually it's what we do now. It's just we measure the EEG waves uh, by this, uh, you know, uh, uh, captors up there. We measure breathing for sleep apnea with this nasal cannula, and also we try to measure oral breathing to make sure that people don't breathe through the mouth. We measure the respiratory effort with some belts. Uh, we measure also leg movements, and everything is kind of hooked up to a box. And you can imagine you don't really sleep very well with this instrument. And it's not really, uh, actually it gives you a good picture of sleep in a qualitative way. If you have sleep apnea, if you have leg movements, but it doesn't give you a good measure of sleep in your natural environment. So that's a big problem. And this is a result of a sleep study. In fact, uh, it's very funny, I often ask that question, how many people uh, recorded with this kind of setup of sleep study every, every year in the US, and most people, they answer, oh, 10,000, you know. Uh, in fact, it's, several, it's a million per year. So it's not a small little business, you know. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of sleep clinics that do that all the time, including ours, that does 8,000 per year. And uh, that's uh, great because this way the medical school makes a lot of money. But uh, we, have, uh, we measure the brain wave, which is the EEG, uh, which is very important to know the, brain, the, the activity and the sleep stages. And I'm sure you all know that you go through, when you fall asleep, you go into deeper and deeper sleep. That's called non-REM sleep. Your cortex kind of rests, and you have these big waves that occur. And then suddenly, after about one, uh, one hour and a half, you go into this very weird type of sleep that's called REM sleep, where you dream and you have, uh, you have uh, rapid eye movements and you are completely paralyzed and otherwise you would be enacting your dreams. And this is called REM sleep. And then you go back into this non-REM sleep and you have this cycle and towards the morning hours, uh, when your body temperature is the lowest, you have a lot of REM sleep and you dream a lot. Um, and we measure that through the brain waves, through the muscle tone, as well as through the uh, uh, eye movements, electroculogram. And of course, we measure also breathing, and we measure if people snore, we measure the EKG. We typically also measure the respiratory efforts and the leg movements. So you see it's a lot of physiological signal. And to be honest, what's very sad about this data is technicians, humans, like just go through it, uh, actually it, every 30 seconds, because it used to be on paper. So we have kept this 30 second rule you know, because it's like 30 second paper, so we move the screen every 30 second, and people look at what kind of stage of sleep you are in, and then try to figure out if you breathe or not breathe, which gives you an idea of the apnea hypopnea index. For sleep apnea, how much you do and you stop breathing. Uh, if, if those are associated with waking up or with oxygen desaturation, and then your leg movements. And at the end, you get one number. And that's it. So it's really absurd because there is an incredible richness of data and all the data is thrown out. Um, so of course we have been actually starting to work on machine learning several years ago uh, through various uh, collaboration with uh, Danish Technical University and some other researchers. And uh, we very quickly found out that uh, doing machine learning is much more efficient uh, than human scoring for most of those uh, criteria and give you not only better information, but also more interesting information. For example, uh, we started to do some work on sleep scoring, like differentiating stage one, stage two, dreaming, etc. cetera. And uh, what was very nice, we, we studied, we first did some feature extraction. I know that nowadays we'll probably use end-to-end -end, uh, you know, solutions, but basically very simple uh, Fourier analysis or autocorrelations. 
uh, and then we use the features that were derived from this very simple transformation into an LSTM models, and then we could uh, very quickly, uh, because of course we have tons and tons of annu annotated data. We have these people who go through each page and say sleep stage one, stage two, stage three. So of course we have millions of data points every epoch, and so it learned very, very quickly with these models, and at the end, uh, how do you show that your model is better than people? I mean, you ask five or six people to score the same sleep recording, and then you ask them each time, each, each uh, 30 seconds, is it stage one, stage two, et cetera, and you get a consensus, and for example, here you have a mean of each six scores that give you a probability of each stage by scores, and basically the black, for example, is REM sleep, and you see that the first black period here you have this uh, little uh, five out of six cores says it's dreaming, and one so it's stage two. So that's why it's blue. Uh, and then in other epochs, you know, at the beginning, the person went in white, so he was awake, and then fell asleep. And what's really beautiful about machine learning is, as you saw in the last presentation, it doesn't only give you maybe is it uh, stage one, stage two, another epoch of sleep. It gives you a probability of each sleep stage. So immediately, that's the beauty of even supervised machine learning. It starts to give you ideas about other things. Because for example, here, we could not only get, you know, is it stage REM, but what is the probability of being in stage REM versus and other sleep stages? And of course, uh, not only it was doing better than, than uh, you know, even uh, any single score when you compare the performance of machine learning to any single score, uh, it was closer to the consensus of the six scores, but also it give, was giving you a probability of each uh, sleep stage. Of course, we, you, you know, anything you do, machine learning or not, uh, you always have to reproduce in independent data, et cetera, avoid overfitting, et cetera. And also, uh, what we always do is not only we, we uh, of course, set a set data to, uh, we avoid overfitting with resampling, but also, of course, we repeat in independent data, but also we like to even have the program work on many diverse data sets. So we try to get data set. I'm a big collaborator, so I work with China, with France, with any country, and I try to get data set as diverse as possible so that this way the model regenerates well. And even better, I usually try to even, we even try to reproduce, to test the machine learning in the data that has never been seen, some kind of transfer learning to make sure that it really works well. And we have done all this for most of our algorithm, and they really behave well. But one other thing for, in, in, for example, sleep stages, you want to make sure that your program of machine learning is going to score sleep well independently of any pathology. So for example, we checked here that whether or not you have insomnia, sleep apnea, restless leg number, you know, the performance, the difference between uh, manual scoring and machine learning scoring was not different. And as you see, we found really no difference with age, sex, et cetera. But what was really interesting is there is one pathology which is uh, pathologies that I've worked more in my other part of my life where I do mostly biology, uh, where I try to study this disorder called type 1 narcolepsy, which is relatively rare. It's a disorder where people dream while they're awake, or sometimes they're paralyzed. Where they're awake, they have this mixed state where they're half dreaming and half in REM sleep, and half awake. And this is called type 1 narcolepsy, and it's due to a little ch a chemical imbalance. It's an autoimmune disorder. But as you see, there were very bad matches between the machine uh, learning and the, and the human scoring. In fact, I think it's both because the humans cannot score well uh, and the machine learning has trouble. And indeed, what you see is sometimes there are periods of time where the machine learning says 30% probability of REM sleep, 30% probability of wake, and 30% probability of stage one. So it's kind of a mixed state where people are not really in REM sleep, not dreaming, they are half dreaming and half awake, which is part of the pathology. So in fact, we use this probability uh, distributions that we obtained from our hypnodensity plots, you know, these probability plots that we got from machine learning to really uh, uh, use that as a diagnostic tool for narcolepsy. When we started to compare narcolepsy, we saw that the probability distribution in the different sleep stages were different. And in fact, now we have uh, tested more than uh, you know, uh, 800 different narcoleptics, and we can diagnose narcolepsy directly with a night of sleep. Instead of before, we were using nap tests, uh, which take an entire day. 
uh, now we can actually do that just by analyzing using machine learning so the nature of the sleep and the probability distribution of the different sleep stages during nocturnal sleep. So it's just to tell you that machine learning, even when you use supervised machine learning, it sometimes gives you ideas way beyond just your uh, first impression. Uh, similarly, we have designed very effective tools to uh, measure microarousals. One of the key uh, problems we have in sleep studies is often people wake up only for a fraction of seconds, like not a fraction of seconds, but two or three seconds. And those are not captured with the regular scoring that we do. But of course, it can make you very tired. And again, the same way with supervised machine learning, we have found ways to uh, actually do better than human scores in detecting these microarousals which can disrupt sleep. And we always, uh, we can check that these microarousals, they occur either when you have sleep apnea and you stop breathing and you wake up for a fraction of seconds, or because you have leg movements or spontaneously, they can be classified much better than when you do a manual scoring. And again, uh, we, we show that it can generalize to never seen data. And then what's, I, I was very interested by one comment, what's very hard in our field, I, I feel in machine learning, there's always something new. So it's terrible because do you restart the training with all your data set with a new algorithm or do you try to do some transfer learning? I think that's really one of the big problems we have right now is what, how do we do to uh, be able to have access to most, more various data set where sometimes there is some channels missing uh, and also, um, you know, use new algorithm without losing all the training that we have done with other algorithm. But for example, here we, we, for apnea, it's actually a completely absurd scoring. I mean, the way we score apnea is when people stop breathing. There is central apnea where you just stop breathing because your brain tells you to stop. So it's like I do. And for example, we heard about pain management. People who are opioids, take opioids, usually die because they stop breathing. And very often they stop breathing during their sleep. Uh, and it's basically a central apnea. Your brain kind of tells you to stop breathing. The most common is sleep apnea obstructive, as I mentioned, this kind of sleep apnea that where you snore and stop breathing. And then there is another intermediary type that we call apopnea, where you breathe a bit less well and you snore, but you don't completely stop breathing. To be honest, this classification is completely absurd, but that's the way it is. And, and, but we found that it was a very... Uh, uh, because it was three different events, we decided to use a, a new technique uh, that, that uh, was uh, um, uh, from YOLO, which basically was, was really uh, on, on uh, image recognition, but allows recognition of multiple objects at once. Uh, so that was ideal to try to recognize three different sub-objects. And it seems that similarly, this kind of uh, deep learning uh, methods work as well as, as technicians. So what we are, one of the things we're doing now is trying to replace completely uh, manual, learn, manual scoring. We, and we know we can. I mean, it's absolutely obvious that it's always doing better than humans. Uh, and then at the same time, we're looking at ideas to improve and go beyond you, uh, you know, what a human can do, but better. And of course, I am not talking about unsupervised approaches, but you can imagine right now we have five sleep stages. Why? It's just uh, something that people have decided. Maybe there is 10 if you do some unsupervised clustering. So beyond the supervised machine learning, which I think is very important to do, because you'll be surprised, but I'm sure you all experience that in this field. The biggest problem is the doctor. I'm a doctor. And doctors don't want to change. They just want to make money. And then <laughs> <coughs> and the insurance don't want to change. So it, it's terrible because we just, you have to bring the field progressively towards something more and more uh, radical. And personally, I, I, I really do believe that, uh, you know, trying to first reproduce what humans do, showing it's better, and then going beyond that is a method uh, to go there. But not only we are doing that uh, for, uh, you know, just for improving, uh, you know, accuracy of, 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 of diagnosis, but also I have developed, a, uh, I'm start, I started a, a, a study that's called the Stanford Technology Analytics and Genomic of, of Sleep, which is funded by the Klarman Family Foundation, which I think is very exciting. That's going to merge machine learning, genetics, and proteomics. And here's the design of the study. We're basically having, going to have about 30,000 people who have objective sleep, the full polysomnography with heart rate, everything, so that we have objective sleep measures. 
At the same time, we also have an actigraph, uh, which can measure sleep for like two or three weeks. Not, not sleep, but just activity. Uh, it's a little bit like a Fitbit. I mean, they're all the same. It's a triaxial accelerometer. They all do the same thing, uh, except that they cost uh, different prices. Uh, then we also, I heard about facial recognition, we have a 3D uh, picture of the face because sleep apnea, of course, I mentioned is when you are obese and you have a little bit more fat in your throat. That's why you don't breathe well and you start to snore and have uh, sleep apnea. But another reason for sleep apnea sometimes is when you have a very small jaw because then you have less space in your upper airway. So we are very interested in the morphology, the facial morphology of people who have sleep apnea. And then we have a very complex questionnaire about everything you want to know about sleep. If you snore, your habits, if you're a part-time student, because of course, also sleep is not just uh, you know, physiology. It depends on your social life. You know, some people are part-time students, have two jobs. Some people are shift workers. So all this has to be taken into consideration. Uh, and, and then a lot of symptoms about, about sleep. Uh, and, and of course, that's important because even if we find, for example, genes or proteins that are associated with specific sleep waves, it will have no clinical application. You want to make sure this is a kind of an endophenotype for something that's a real complaint. If we find genes for spindles and then you show that spindles is very important for insomnia, then it becomes important. But if you just find a gene for spindle, nobody will be interested. That's why the subjective sleep data is very important because that's what people complain about. Uh, and then we also have, uh, finally, uh, this, this neurocognitive battery. And this will be the biggest data set where we'll have objective uh, sleep in, in a very large number of people and we'll be able to apply machine learning and also add the genetic data. And as I will mention, probably proteomics, which will be uh, one of the last part of my talk. So why do we do genetics? Uh, I think you heard probably from uh, Mike Snyder. I think uh, genetics is fantastic because, you know, it's, it's like a pond where you can fish every fish. You know, you have three billion base pair, and now we can study them all. So it's kind of a, a change in paradigm. Uh, instead of trying to find something, you can study everything at once and find what comes up. And to give you an example, my field is narcolepsy, which is due to a chem where this uh, chemical imbalance of a particular neurotransmitter called orexin or hypocretin, and it's an autoimmune disease. But uh, you know, we didn't really know anything about narcolepsy until I kind of isolated the gene in a dog model of narcolepsy that shows that it was hypocretin related. But then in humans, we couldn't really find an obvious cause. But when you scan all the chromosome using what's called a genome-wide association, you kind of try to find which region of the human chromosome have uh, association with a specific disease, you see that all the genes that you find immediately uh, when you read what they do in the literature, they're all immune related. So by doing this kind of genetic analysis, you get the, the cause of a problem, which here is really autoimmune. And in fact, by doing even more work now, we pretty much know that narcolepsy is due to an autoimmune disease where you actually it's triggered by the flu and the flu gets confused with hypocretin or rexin, and then your immune system starts to kill the cells that produce this hypocretin or rexin peptide, thinking it's the flu because it has, it's very similar, and then after you have narcolepsy for the rest of your life. So, uh, but the genetics give you a clue of what kind of pathophysiology it is. So the great thing about the genetic is it's at the cause of things. I mean, you cannot, once you are born, you have the same genetic for life. So it's very important because it, it can give you an access to causality. And right now, one of the most exciting area in, in genetics is called Mendelian randomization. The idea is that because the genes you are born with it, it's almost like a clinical trial. You are really born, and then sometimes you have this genetic polymorphism, sometimes you don't have it, but it's almost like if you had been randomized with a certain genetic, or without a certain genetic, and then if you can link a disease to this particular genetic uh, uh, variant, and then at the same time, you can also link something intermediary, either a phenotype or a blood marker to the gene and to the disease, then you establish this kind of causality pathway where you know that this uh, uh, phenotype becomes then part, part of the cause of the problem. For example, let me give you an example. You know, you know that dementia is associated with a gene called APOE, which is a lipid carrier. If you can see that APOE uh, levels are also changed by the genotype, 
then you can uh, kind of show that the ApoE level in the blood are really not just a consequence of the disease, but really a cause of the disease. And if you can modify them, you should modify the disease. So it's very important because it allows you to tell if something is causal or is a consequence. And for sleep, of course, it's very important because if you don't sleep well, everything changes. So you want to know if you see a change in your blood, for example, for a certain factor, is it something that's mediating the fact that you don't sleep well, or is it because you don't sleep well that it's changing? And this kind of combined genetic analysis with biomarker is really one way to get that causality. And one of the most promising area in this uh, um, domain, I think, is proteomics. I don't know if Mike Snyder spoke about it uh, last, uh, last time, but the genetics for me is a bit passé in some ways. Uh, because, you know, we, we have all the techniques, they work really well. But proteomics is really emerging. And proteomics is really what matters. It's what you measure in your blood, etc. And you'll be very surprised because we still do exactly the same kind of medicine as 200 years ago. I mean, we, for example, if we measure kidney function, we still measure one particular thing in blood that's called creatinine. And honestly, it doesn't make any sense because if you measure 10,000 things in the blood, you find 50 that kind of correlates with glomerular filtration. So it doesn't make sense to measure one thing. It's much better to measure 50 things and then get a multivariate construct because it will reflect much better your glomerular filtration than just one factor that's often uh, partially modified by other factor. So I think uh, uh, things are going to change rapidly once we can measure thousands and thousands of things in blood in one scoop. So same way as when we could measure all the genetics in one scoop. But what's more interesting about what you can measure in the blood is that it's not only modified by the genetic, but it's also modified by the environment. So, you know, it's much more direct. Like cholesterol, of course, is linked with genes, but it's also linked with what you eat. So at the end, cholesterol matters more than your gene for cholesterol. So uh, we, we are working with this company that has developed a very exciting platform. So the problem with proteomics is like fusion. It has always said that it's going to work next year. I'm sure you have heard, uh, you know, next year we'll have full uh, energy forever. But we have waited for a long time, it hasn't worked. And the reason is there were like two main, uh, you know, techniques that were used. One of them was really uh, uh, what's MS, mass spect. And, but that's not very quantitative. And then another where ELISA, based on antibodies, but that's very difficult to multiplex. And there's a couple of new technology now that allows us to actually multiplex very well. And one of them is called this Aptamer uh, uh, technique, where basically you use oligo, pieces of DNA or RNA, that can directly interact with proteins selectively. And then this way you can actually design this oligo like if they were antibodies, you mix them up in a, in a blood sample, and each one is going to recognize a different protein. And then at the end, you, you hybridize them on an array. You transform that into DNA uh, kind of information, and then you can quantify thousands of protein. And in fact, this, protein, this new platform can measure up to 5,500 proteins in 100 microliter of blood, for example. I mean, that's a complete change. And to give you an example, we try to predict age with actually this is an older platform with only 1,300 protein. So we didn't even use the new platform. And basically, of course, we use uh, you know, a very simple uh, machine learning uh, technology. And uh, we, when we uh, did this, we, we can actually predict age within three years. So for example, I can take a blood sample and I can predict your age within three years with a 95% confidence interval. That's pretty good, and, and uh, that's just to show you. And of course, some of these proteins are consequence of aging, and others are probably causal in the aging process, but that will be uh, too long to explain, but that's through the genetics that you may be able to, to differentiate the cause and consequence. So that really told me that it was really great for sleep, because one of the big problems with sleep is besides this clear pathology, again, we still don't know why you get tired when you're sleep deprived, and also, another thing that everyone wants to know is what's your internal body time? I mean, some of you must have been traveling and you are just on a wrong time zone, but sometimes I see patients and they told me, oh, I'm tired all day long, I don't sleep well at night, and I really don't know if their sleep is not good or is it their circadian clock that's completely wrong and they're basically living in Tokyo time while in California. We have no way of, of, of distinguishing these two things right now. It's impossible. Uh, and every, we have to measure melatonin, and we'd have to measure melatonin continuously in the dark, 
and see when it peaks to know what is the normal circadian clock of this person. So it's not feasible. And uh, proteomics might be a good way to, to do this. And uh, the way we, we, we do this is we take people to measure circadian clock. We take people 24 hours, 36 hours in a complete uh, routine. So they stay like in the, in the dim light. They eat a meal every two hours and we force them not to sleep. So this way, anything that continues to fluctuate can only be, and they cannot exercise, can only be circadian. You know, it has to be independent of sleep because if something goes up at the middle of the night, even so you are, you are not sleeping, it cannot be sleep dependent. And this is a very uh, uh, a time consuming protocol called uh, constant routine. But what's fantastic is when you do that on 1,300 protein or 5,000 proteins, you actually find a lot of proteins that go up and down at different times of the day. And for example, this is a plot where you, know, you see that some proteins are going up you know, uh, at many different times of the clock, clock time. And in theory, with this kind of many proteins, when you measure many proteins, what's very elegant is maybe you can take only one blood sample at any time and then predict where the circadian time of a person is. Because if, uh, for example, cortisol is very low, something else is very high, this is intermediary, et cetera, you know, it really gives you the time, the circadian time of a person. And we actually tested that by, uh, by machine learning again, uh, but you have to have a lot of data, that's always a problem. So you need a lot of people in this kind of constant routine, uh, you know, uh, condition where you take blood sample every hour, and then you analyze all these proteins, it's a little costly. But at the end, uh, we can now predict uh, roughly within two years the, the circadian time of people. So I can take a blood sample of anyone and I can tell roughly, oh, you know, your circadian time is about one hour longer or earlier than most other people. And if you are completely living on Tokyo time, I will also figure that out. So that's, I think, is going to change sleep medicine quite a bit. Similarly, we are working on, on proteins that change with sleep deprivation. Can you imagine if one day you could have a test where you take a blood sample and say, ah, oh, you have slept only three hours. Uh, that will also completely change the way we look at sleep medicine. And this kind of technology, I think, is also applicable to that. We already started to find a panel of proteins that changes with sleep deprivation. So I think uh, it's a very new world. Uh, with this uh, proteomics. And of course, if you link it to the genetic, it, we are even going to be able to uh, see what, what, is, uh, uh, what is causal and what is consequence. We are also starting to look at sleep apnea proteins. And of course, you can imagine every time you stop breathing and you have oxygen changes, a lot of protein change in your blood. So we, we have certain proteins that clearly correlate with sleep apnea. So maybe we will be able to also take a blood sample and diagnose patients with sleep apnea. And we know what's important is not only to do cross-sectional, but also look what happened longitudinally. So the main treatment for, not, for sleep apnea is CPAP. We put kind of a mask, and then we, it allows people to breathe because you push the air in, and uh, people can breathe because there's a little pressure. And I'm sure some of you know CPAP. Uh, and we can take blood sample before and after CPAP, and also, of course, look if the same protein are changing when you treat the CPAP in the same person. And we indeed are finding some very, very strong markers of sleep apnea that we think could be even used to see how people are compliant, et cetera. Uh, so really, my, my goal is to uh, find a panel of proteins that's going to predict circadian phase and amplitude with a single blood sample, also how much sleep you have had uh, in the past, and maybe some proteins that reflect hypoxia when you have sleep apnea or certain sleep disorders. And then finally, link it to the genetics and to the machine learning of the sleep recording to really understand the whole pathophysiology and, and maybe the pathways that are involved in sleep regulation and sleep disorders. And in that last point, I want to say is that right now I'm doing this full PSG, but it's because the insurance are paying for it, so I'm very happy. It's, uh, it's actually great because you have a lot of physiological data, but truly I don't really understand why it's not disappearing even faster than it should. It should disappear fast, because there's really no reason. We could probably have very simple sensors that could give you almost the same information. So together with uh, uh, Lydia Wu, Ma Michael uh, Adapun, and, and Zinan Bao, 
We are, for example, working on trying to do new sensors that could measure EEG. We believe that the sound, I, I was uh, interested in voice recognition, but it's true that, I mean, snoring is like a music. I mean, I can tell you, every snore is different. And I can tell you that if you measure sound very carefully, you can really tell if someone stopped breathing just because they decided to stop breathing or because they are snoring and they have sleep apnea. So I think actually just sound should diagnose sleep apnea as well as all this complicated recording we do. Uh, the sleep stages I think we still need because I really believe in brain activity. And unfortunately, we don't have non-contact non sensors that can measure brain activity. Right now, actually, there's a big fight. is people who think you can sleep in a bed that's going to measure everything without touching you. So that's a non-contact sensor business. Or s contact sensor where you can uh, have, maybe we put one patch here that measure your EEG, some things that measure sound, and some things that measure your leg movements, and you have everything. I'm actually working more in the, in the contact sensors because I believe there is nothing yet that can replace brain activity measurements without touching the person. But I agree that's a close fight. You know, maybe the people who only measure non-contact, uh, you know, physiology with uh, various, they may win. But really at the end, you don't need that much. You need really, uh, if you stop breathing, your brain activity and your leg movements. So I think it could really be simplified and at the end, it could really be probably almost a, a, a measure of your brain health, because you could imagine wearing these things at home, sending the data through the web, and then it will be automatically processed by machine learning, and it will tell you how, even how your sleep is and what kind of disease you have, and even if it's changing. We also all know that when you develop depression, sleep is the first thing to change, but nobody has really looked if there's predictors in your EGs that could tell you that you're going to develop depression. Uh, for dementia, for sure, it's changing. For Parkinson's disease, there's very specific changes that we already know happen during sleep way before it starts. So there's a trove of biomarkers, and it will be even more obvious when you really study it permanently at home. And uh, we also want to link that to genetic to get the molecular components that really are generating sleep. We want to find this biomarker of sleep disorders. We really believe that you need automatic non-human -an non analysis basis of sleep signals. You need a new wearable device that can be used at home. And uh, at the end, I think what would be very attractive is if at the same time it's analyzing sleep, it can produce directly a feedback to you. For example, if you have a sleep apnea, you could imagine that it could stop your sleep apnea. I mean, that will be a long story, but you could imagine a technology that automatically finds that you have sleep apnea at each moment you have sleep apnea changes your breathing. And I think uh, we are really, I mean, there is not a field that's more exciting than sleep. I mean, as you know, a lot of people are working on cardiovascular disease. I mean, Apple has done a lot of work on cardiovascular disease, but I think sleep is a new frontier because it's, it's encompassing many, many more things uh, than just the cardiovascular system. These are a few of the people that have participated in the work that I'm presenting. Uh, we, Aditya uh, is in my lab, and he, he, he does a lot of machine learning. Um, and uh, I want to mention that I'm uh, working a lot with some people at the Danish Technical University, as well as uh, people from Ecole Polytechnique in the machine learning area. Thank you so much for your attention. Go ahead. Uh, is there a commonly accepted understanding of what constitutes good sleep? You mentioned that you're trying to find uh, what proteins or other factors prevent people from having a slept well. Uh, but what actually defines it? Uh, is it the amount of deep sleep, REM sleep, duration of it? Uh, because there are different, different metrics, but I, I don't know how you would define it. So I, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, like a good researcher, I'm going to tell you that we don't know, <laughs> but I'm, uh, I would say still it's not true. We know certain things. For example, we know that sleep needs to be continuous, so if it's interrupted, it's bad. We also know that, of course, if you have all this sleep apnea and so forth, often you, you don't even wake up. These microarousals may, wake, may just wake you up on your brain, but you don't realize, you are not conscious if it's not long enough, so you, you definitely need to have no sleep apnea, no movement. Uh, and probably you need a balance uh, of all these sleep stages. However, when I'm telling you that, it's just describing what's a good sleep. But 
I, we don't know which factor is more important. That we don't know. For example, there may be certain waves that may be more important. Uh, I, I don't think anybody can tell you that you need a certain percent of REM sleep, a little less, a little more. In fact, there is some rational to say that too much sleep is not good either. For insomnia, that's what's happening. A lot of people that have insomnia, they just worry about their sleep, and they try to sleep too hard, and as a consequence, they try to sleep eight hours where they need only six, and then it makes their sleep very fragmented, and it makes it even worse. So a good sleep is, is sleep where you don't wake up, and you have all the sleep stages in an ordinary fashion, and where you don't have all these pathologies. Unfortunately, many people don't have normal sleep. I mean, it's like 30% of the population. Most people have a little bit of something wrong. And, uh, and things like, how do you feel refreshed in the morning? What correlates best? We don't have that. But for example, that 30,000 study will have this kind of question to try to answer. Uh, I don't know, okay. So we, we measure things, we measure lots of proteomics, we get all these great biomarkers. How does that link to therapy? Because if CPAP is your therapy, and that's your only card, then you either use it or you don't, and maybe there's some issues with adjusting the CPAP machine. But what else might there be? That's a, a, a good question. So of course, you could imagine still, here I mostly talked about the proteomics in the context of diagnosis and maybe following up if people are compliant. You probably know that people who take CPAP very often, they don't use it, or they use it half of the time, and that's just not sufficient. So that may allow us to better understand how people use it. But of course, the real price, and I'm, I'm old-fashioned, I believe that understanding is the most important before acting. I think many people, you know, Maybe in the government don't believe that, but usually <laughs> we have to definitely. Uh, and, and I think if we can understand all the sub-phenotype of sleep apnea, for example, this would have been a long story, but uh, we know that sleep apnea is not just one problem. Some decrease the oxygen, some don't decrease the oxygen. Some wake up immediately after starting to stop breathing. For other people, it, it's a muscle tone in their, in their throat that is a problem. For others, it's a way the, the brain reacts to CO2 changes. And I didn't mention that, but actually the machine learning is starting to give us some hints about this, about subtypes of sleep apnea that could have different treatment. Uh, you know, maybe then you can design treatments that would uh, increase the muscle tone in, in, in the throat. For others, it would be regulating the way your brain cap, you know, is, is, uh, is measuring oxygen, et cetera. And there, I'm actually involved in a biotech that's trying to find treatment for these subtypes of sleep apnea. CPAP, the problem is it works great, but people don't use it. About 50% of people just hate to be dark Vader, you know, with, uh, with this. Uh, so it helps a lot of people, but a lot of people just uh, don't use it. And we need to find new treatment. I, I believe, for example, we could find drugs that could treat certain form of sleep apnea. But for that, we need to understand better the physiology. Now you're right that measuring blood biomarkers may not always be sufficient. Um, I'm not saying I have the solution for everything, <laughs> sadly. <coughs> Thank you so much, but I will be here so you can ask me some questions. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a quick break now. We're going to be back at 11.15 uh, sharp for Aviad Chai. <laughs> 